don't listen to all the the doubts of of doing this kind of thing. It, it, life's an adventure, so why not make the most of it? And I think this is a huge way to, to do that. Welcome to another season of I Taught English Abroad, where we cover a range of topics from the world of TEFL. This podcast has it all, from passport stamps to recruitment, tips for teachers who want to be internet sensations, finding accommodation in far-flung locales, and so much more. Subscribe now so you don't miss any new episodes. If you've stayed in a youth hostel anywhere in the world and heard a chirpy East American accent, chances are it was our next guest, Matt Mitzel. Matt, with his own interest and family background and childhood of travelling, has made it his personal mission to get to every country in the world, yet he's never been to Glasgow on a cold autumn night. Interesting choice, Matt. We cover the niceties of Istanbul, the career of Lionel Messi, and of course, teaching around the world. Here's Matt's story. Now, Matt Mitzel is someone who got in touch with us, wants to tell his story. Also happens to be a former colleague of one of, one of our guests from a previous episode. So we've got it all going on. And, and he's a man who has stated his ambition to go to every country in the world. So I think we'll have plenty to talk about here. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm very good. Uh, how are you? Thank you so much for having not me. Not at all. On. Not at all. So it's, it's it's great to have you on. And you know, we've spoken to a few a few uh, guests on this podcast who've who've come from America, but you seem to be a very sort of you know, more of a man of the world, if you like, a uh, very sort of international kind of kind of person. And, and we'll we'll delve into that a wee bit more. But growing up in Maryland, did you have particular ambitions to travel? Was there anyone in your family who travelled for work, for example? Because I feel like that sort of wanderlust and, and the want to travel the world really, really informs the rest of the conversation we'll have. So did, was that based on anything or was that kind of just an ambition of your own? Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, being from Maryland, uh, for those who don't know, you know, small state on the East Coast, uh, I think the best state. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, so my... Uh, parents were really big into travel growing up. On my mom's side, uh, my, you know, she's a Colombian, so my grandmother being from Bogota, so you know that was you know big big uh, thing for us kind of thing to you know really explore our roots. So you know we had taken a trip to Colombia at a young age, and then my dad was a big traveler as well. So he he took me to China on a business trip when I was in middle school. So just you know that was a really big big moment for us and you know every year we would do some type of travel you know whether it be somewhere closer like a Canada or Mexico or you know like I said this Colombia trip or China trip and you know just my parents were really big on using the breaks and money for travel kind of thing so it was really you know instilled on me in a at a very young age and you know here I am 28 years old and as I as you had mentioned my, my goal is to visit every country in the world and I think that started at a young age and just I am so passionate about travel. Well, in terms of travel, and obviously you had those ambitions to travel the world, but it wasn't always necessarily through teaching English, if, I, if I'm right now. You were taking part in an internship when you decided to study for a TEFL certificate. Something we've cover, we, we continue to cover a lot at the TEFL org is the idea of being a career changer. So what, was there a career that you had in mind prior to wanting to teach abroad, or was it always the goal to, to teach English overseas? Yeah, so it definitely was, I guess you could say, like a career changer kind of moment. So after I graduated college, you know, I studied uh, public relations and marketing kind of thing. And so I was working at an internship in, in D.C. at a PR firm. And I had just, you know, previously that year, I had gone with the boys. We did a little backpacking trip in Europe. The year prior, I did a solo backpacking trip. And I just, I knew I wanted to do something travel oriented. And I think I was kind of at a crossroads in my life just you know doing this internship you know when that ends you know am I getting like a job or what is it that I want to do and my mom she she was you know being a big traveler as well she had studied abroad in the, the 80s studied abroad in Spain and she had mentioned that her co-worker son had taught English abroad and you know she's like oh Matthew you know, this is something, you know, I know you want to travel kind of thing. And, you know, maybe you don't necessarily know what kind of work you want to do, but maybe you could do this while you, you know, figure things out. And, you know, this is a way for you to get the best of both worlds. You would, you know, live abroad, but you have that opportunity to work abroad as well. So, you know, she told me about it. I did some research and then, you know, got got the TEFL certificate. And then from there, I decided, yeah, I'm 
I'm off. Let's 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 make that move uh, abroad, wherever in the world it may be. But yeah, so I think shout out to my mom for giving me that that idea. So I think that really spurred me in the right direction. And so you know, when you did your TEF certificate, I'm interested to know a bit more about about your background. Actually, so obviously you come from that background that's quite culturally diverse. You know, there's there's Colombian, I'm gonna guess, you know, Spanish speaking influence in there. So. Was there anything that caught you by surprise when you were doing your TEFL certificate? Because English is obviously, you know, your first language, but what was it like kind of learning it from a teacher's perspective? Was there anything that surprised you in there? Yeah, I mean, totally, because, you know, it is teaching English as a foreign language. It's something, you know, that I've grown up learning English kind of thing. And all my schooling, everything's in English. Of course, I took some Spanish classes kind of thing. But the whole concept is very foreign to me. It's like, oh, teaching my language as a foreign language, here I am viewing other languages foreign. So it's like, you know, learning about different methods and how to do that when, you know, again, like I'm just thinking like, oh yeah, I learned English and you know, I don't really know how I learned English kind of thing. Like here we are going into the grammar and but how to teach grammar. And so, you know, it's just, just very interesting because again, I just had no prior knowledge to having to do that. So it was just all, it was all a very foreign concept to me because again, the teaching, but then how to give my language of instruction. It's a, it's a, it's a big undertaking, but you know, it, it's one that you've ultimately you've been really successful in, uh, and we'll cover all the places where you've taught, but you know, we have to go to the first one, clearly. Now, you picked a slightly unusual, the country itself, not an unusual place to go and teach English. It's, it's a wonderful destination. But you went to Ribera in uh, northwest Spain. Now, it's not, again, the most necessarily the most obvious choice for a TEFL location in Spain, but it's quite near to Vigo, which it turns out has the highest, amongst the highest levels of proficiency uh, in English in all of Spain. So, so talk us through the decision to go to Ribera, uh, what your time was like there, and, and what made you choose the northwest of Spain as a, as a kind of launching point? Yeah, so it was, it's funny you, you bring it up because, um, so I got certified in, in the fall, and to go to Spain through, I went through a, a program called Up International, and their hiring period is for September, October, you know, for the, the duration of the year until May or June, depending on where in Spain you are. But since I got certified in the fall, you know, the options and the opportunities were limited. So I, when I got my certificate in November and I started looking at Spain because I'd been to Spain um, the year prior, you know, there weren't many opportunities. And so speaking to the recruiters, they said, hey, I mean, yeah, I mean, thank you for reaching out. But, you know, to be honest, we don't really have anything. Um, you might have to wait for the following year. But so then someone in, in Ribeira had dropped the program. And so there was that position that opened up. So they said to me, you can either go forward with this. And again, I didn't know anything about Northwest of Spain. You know, my whole Spain knowledge is the cliche Barcelona, Madrid. So it was either, okay, you know, if I really want Spain, this is my opportunity to go now, small town, you know, see what it's about, or wait for the next year with that, or pick another country. So I said, well, I mean, I'm pretty sure I really want Spain, so I don't care if it's a small town or whatever. I mean, I'm going to Spain. It must have some type of transportation to where, you know, it may, you know, where in Spain I would like to travel, this and that. And, you know, I come from a small town. I think Ribeira actually is bigger than my small town. So... I said, yeah, let's do it. I, I, I'm not going to wait. You know, I, I know I want to be somewhere by January, December. You know, the, the faster my internships in December, the faster I can go, the, the, the happier I'll be. So, you know, again, it was just let, let's do it. Let's take that leap. You know, I, again, it's small town. But, you know, wouldn't that be probably more authentic than the Madrid Barcelona? Because it's as small town as you can get. And it was on the water. So I said, let's do it. So then I went through with the visa process, you know, the Up International really was a big help with it. And then it, I think I was on the ground in January. So it all really kind of sped the whole process by getting certified in November to actually reaching Spain. It was very quick and, you know, I never looked back. And so, I mean, you, you talked about going on a backpacking trip by yourself and with your friends, but was moving to Ribera, you know, with that population of under 30,000, was that actually quite a good thing in terms of culture shock and, and being able to settle? Do, do you think, you know, when you move somewhere to, to actually live and, and work for the first time, do you think moving somewhere smaller actually helped as opposed to, you know, being kind of lost in a crowd of millions, do you think? 
So I think probably for the general person, yes. But for me, you know, living in D.C. for the time that I was there and I went to school outside D.C., you know, I really, I think, used college as like, oh, I need a city kind of thing. So for me, it was kind of like, I actually really want the city, but because there's the opportunity, I went back. But I think, yeah, I think it is a great, you know, looking back on it, I think it's a great way to really get settled and to, you know, understand how a culture you know, works and, you know, really becoming part of a tight knit community, you know, as opposed to, like you said, being thrown into the, you know, little fish in the big pond, that might be more daunting to someone. But for me, I think <laughs> I would have preferred that. But looking back on it, no, it was a great, great time there. And, you know, it, it was that whole tight knit community where it's like, this is a stepping board into Spain. Like, okay, let's check out the small city, see how we like it to see if we can live in the big city. So yeah, I mean, of course it was, you know, very, very helpful in that, that sense. But again, I, I, Definitely would have preferred a city in hindsight, but no, it was, it was great. It was a great experience. Well, I mean, you got the big city in the end. You would move on to Barcelona not too long afterwards, and that's obviously a very culturally diverse and, and bustling city. Uh, so, so what was that move like, and and how would you compare your move from the US to Ribera against the move to, from Ribera to Barcelona? Like, were, were was there anything that surprised you? Were you able to settle as as well as you had the move prior? Like, what was that whole process like? If you can break it down for us. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, the whole process of getting to Ribera was kind of, you know, a mission. So you had to fly, I flew to, I think Paris I flew, and then Paris to Madrid, Madrid to Ribera, which Ribera, is, it's in the northwest of Spain, as you mentioned, in the community of Galicia. It's on, on the water. So, you know, it's quite a, quite a mission to get there. You know, I had to fly Madrid to Santiago de Compostela and from there take, like, bus to Ribera. So that was the whole mission as opposed to going to Barcelona. Yeah, I'm just flying direct. So... You know, it was quite the transition because, you know, going from this small town, as you had mentioned, where, you know, not a ton going on, I think, other than the beach, there really isn't a whole lot of a draw there kind of thing, unless you just are big into small towns. But so, you know, then going to Barcelona, it was, you know, like that, again, that being you are so small compared to all all the people, because Barcelona is a big city and it's sprawling. So in Rivera, they set me up. I chose to do a host family, which is a great experience. And so that was all like, you know, they really like held my hand to get, you know, to the host family, all this stuff. Whereas in Barcelona, you know, I am kind of like on my own as in, you know, I need to find accommodation, which I chose. I wanted to do that. And, you know, just going through all that, like, like how do you find accommodation in a big city? Like, what, what, what's, uh, what are the applications? What, what do you do that? So it was kind of that big culture shock not so much in being in Spain but more so in being in the big city more on my own you know so there you know I had to the way you find apartments in Barcelona it's this app that's like the same setup and algorithm as like tinder so it's swiping left and right on apartments you know you are the rent rent rentee and you're looking for the renter and a dialogue is not able to be opened up between you two unless you both swipe right on each other. So it's exactly Tinder before apartments. So that was pretty like crazy because it's like, oh, OK, this is how you all do it here. OK, yeah, we'll do that. But yeah, in terms of the teaching, I, I went to older kids. So in Rebate, I was teaching kids age three till 13. So Barcelona was the bigger kids. So I was 13 up until graduation being 18. So it's all a huge transition from the, the, the teaching to, you know, live, the, the living situation and, you know, being, having access to public transport, you know, it's just in Urbeda, like, I don't even think I use the bus there, but yeah, it was just, you know, small town to a big city and, you know, with everything in between. And, you know, I, I love that adventure kind of thing. So it was a great transition. Excellent. And, and you know, for anyone listening to the, to the podcast, you, you obviously won't see that Matt is currently wearing uh, an Inter Miami shirt. Now, obviously, I have to ask, did uh, <laughs> is that anything to do with a certain Lionel Messi? He would have been playing for Barcelona at, uh, at the time you were there. Was there any, any connection that's that's kind of come from that? I think you hit the yeah you hit it on the head yep one hundred percent i I'm so big into soccer or football, as you might call it, and wherever I travel, I try to collect the scarves or get a jersey so my my wardrobe is all jerseys, and as you mentioned, yeah, Messi was playing in Barcelona at that time, so I went to I think four games, I did a Champions League game as well, saw him score several times, and it was one of those like, oh my God, like 
I saw, you know, him play and him score. So, yeah, you you, you saw you saw right through me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because whenever I try to do sort of country guides for the Tefl Org, I do try and sneak in a football reference every now and then. But I, I don't know how quickly <laughs> they get picked up. But listen, we're going to move away. We're going to we're going to we're going to move away from international football, and uh, we're going to talk about being an international Tefl teacher um, after the short break. Feeling inspired? Fancy trying something completely new? We'll make your best move yet by signing up for a TEFL course with the most highly accredited provider on the planet. Here at the TEFL Org, we offer a range of online and classroom courses that you can study at your own pace. All of our courses include top-of-the-range teaching materials and come with dedicated tutor support from experienced and highly qualified TEFL experts. And what's more, we'll give you money off to do it. Just enter the code PODCAST at checkout to get 50% off any of our internationally recognised TEFL courses. And that includes our best-selling 120-hour Premier Online course. With that code, you'll not only get 50% off, but you'll also get a free lesson plans pack. Within a matter of months, you could be a qualified TEFL teacher out there exploring the world or work into your own schedule from home as an online English teacher. Just use the code PODCAST at checkout to get started. And we're back with Matt Mitzel. Now, you were an English language assistant in Barcelona. Talk us through that role and how that differs from being, you know, the the teacher, if you like. Yeah, so um, one of the big, you know, draws to Spain, you know, you can go through several different programs. Um, as I mentioned, going through Up International, just like the other programs, you are a language assistant. So a little different than being a teacher. So the role, I think, kind of depends on the school that you are associated with and the teachers that you will work with. So in Rivera, I worked with, I don't know, maybe seven different teachers. So each one had a different style as to how they wanted to use you as an English language assistant. So of course that carried into Barcelona. So working with the different grades, some teachers, I think honestly some teachers were not threatened, but more as in like, oh, I don't, why do I have an English language um, assistant? So there were some teachers where I really didn't do much, where again, I think maybe some differences of like, okay, wh- wh- why, why do I have him kind of thing? So that was kind of you know, not, not, not the greatest. But other ones, you know, is more, well, let's use you as, you know, you can supplement what I'm teaching with games or activities to, you know, make it more fun kind of thing. Because these are, you know, high school students. They don't want me to, you know, grill them on a, what's the difference between a verb and an adjective. No, rather... Let's, you know, play some type of game related to what it is that we're learning. So I did all these, you know, kinds of kinds of games and would lead small, dis- small group discussions and things like that. But also being, you know, not from Spain, a big thing for the students was to, you know, give presentations or to talk about things particular to where I'm from, from the U.S. So I would, you know, talk about you know, do presentations about things that were topical or, you know, relating to holidays that were going on. So I talked about, you know, like Halloween in the U.S. and the Super Bowl, like, you know, what it means to us Americans and, you know, doing comparisons. Like, what is it like to be a high schooler in, in you know, from my experience, U.S. to like what, what you guys are doing right now in Spain. So, you know, just it all depended on who the teacher you were working with. But in general, I didn't really do a whole lot of teaching per se it was more the supplementing what it is that they were they were learning the teaching was be more cultural aspects but um you know not so much the, the grammar heavy or it also lead reading kind of thing for pronunciation so it all depended on who you were working with you know because all in all my time in spain is probably 15 to 16 different teachers that i worked with and as i mentioned some you're really not doing much where other ones really was you know, do do what you want, kind of thing. Just make it fun. So you know, not not a lot of direction or instruction. Is you know, do do what it is that you see fit. And so that was nice. But again, I think it's hit or miss with the, the teacher, and then the next per school. In, in terms of your own career development, how how important do you think it was for you to start as a as a um, English language assistant or a language teaching assistant, as they're also known, kind of depending on the program, that kind of thing. You know, in terms of what you're doing now, how informative and helpful was it to have had that experience? 
I think extremely helpful and extremely important for this development kind of thing because you know it is pretty you know I, I didn't come from an education background you know I, I did this TEFL certificate but it was online plus you know 20 hours of practicum that's a lot different than being in a class so I think the English language assistant program is a great way to ease you into it you can figure out well, for one, you can observe the teachers, how they're doing every in all the different styles. If I mentioned 16 different teachers, well, that's 16 different styles. And so you're not really necessarily being thrown to the fire right away. You know, you don't have your own class, don't have to deal with stuff like that. And I think that's good because it's a way to, you know, ease your way into it. And then you can really determine from that, well, do I want to continue forward and find positions that allow me to be a teacher or am I more in a language assistant, do this for how long, or am I done with it completely? So I think it's a good way. It's a little pretest, if you will, to the main, you know, what it is teaching. So, I mean, I picked up a lot of things, you know, different styles and, you know, drills and how to classroom management, all of that. And that was all coming through learning from different teachers and how different schools work. Because each, you know, Barcelona, the school in Barcelona was a big semi-private school. The other one was a more like, Catholic school. So just differences in that kind of thing. So it was a great, great experience. And I think, you know, I don't think I could have done it a better way. You know, I didn't go to, you know, Thailand or something, have a massive class. And it's my first gig. And it's like, oh, wait, well, what is what's this? No, it was language assistant. It's a more controlled environment. So I think it's, it was a great, great way, and very useful. In terms of the commitment that you have as, as an English language assistant, um, you, you know, you, you do have typically more free time as well to be able to explore the, the city or the area that you're in. How would you say, would you reflect on, on that? The amount of time that you had to explore Barcelona, the amount of time you got, you were given to sort of acclimate, you know, to, to Spain in general. Did you think that was a major plus for you? 100%, yeah. I mean, because I, well, be, being in Barcelona too, you know, I was, I lived you know, in the center near Plaza, Plaza Catalunya for people that know it or don't know it, but it was a very center, central plaza. And so it was a perfect location. And, you know, I did have that, that flexibility to go make moves all over the city where, you know, and if I wanted to go to other places, other cities in Spain or other places in Europe, you know, the flights were so cheap and inexpensive. And, you know, I did have that time and it was easier going from Barcelona than from Riveda because that, that was a mission in itself. I wasn't able to you know, do a whole lot of traveling there, which, which is fine. I guess I explored that local area. But also being a language assistant, a, a word of uh, note, so... With the visa that you're provided, you are going under a student visa because Spain has this, you know, program, if you will, that they're expecting you, if you're going as a language assistant, you're also going to be taking a Spanish class. So you're only supposed to be working like 20 hours a week because the rest, I'm doing air quotes for people that aren't looking, is to be studying and taking the classes. So the, the thing that was kind of weird with it, though, you didn't technically, I mean, technically, I mean, you had to do the online course, but if you didn't do it, if, unless you were to stay in Spain again, I mean, what are they going to do? They're not, they're not going to not let you go home kind of thing. So, you know, I, I did do the course. I must say I didn't do that. But because I was only – I was capped at 20 hours a week, you know, some days it's like oh, I'm done at – you know, I have my whole half afternoon or I don't got to come into this time. Why well, use that time to explore kind of thing? You know, seize the moment. I'm in Barcelona, one of the most popular cities in you know, the world. So, yeah, I, I used all this free time and then my weekends and everything to – explore and you know i because i viewed the experience as a way to get to know spain more but also as a gateway to europe i mean where i'm not going to be in the u.s and have an opportunity to have a you know ten dollar flight to italy you know that's a whole i got a plan long time in advance to go from the u.s to italy so it's just making the most of that opportunity absolutely and, and talking of you know you, you've actually introduced a really really good segue which you know if every podcast guest i have could do that that'd be fantastic just a note <laughs> um but you, you talked a little there about uh exploring the rest of europe now as a backpacker to tell us where you went and how easy or difficult it was to travel around especially you know regards visas and that kind of thing like how e easy and affordable is it in this in this sort of day and age yeah so uh just a little you know, talking about how my journey. So, like, I ended in Barcelona in, in July of 2019. And so I had accepted a position to teach in, you know, with Up Again in Madrid because I was just kind of trying to bounce around. But then I decided, you know, I really want to just travel more and figure out what it is my next step. So I decided to get uh, – to go home and save us some money. I was working in, in Baltimore and, you know, did, did this backpacking trip. So the plan was five months and the plan was to go east – 
Or sorry, east from Maryland. We're going to go all throughout Europe. Then we're going to make our way to Asia, you know, back down to like Australia and then to Hawaii and then back to Maryland. So it'd be like a whole, you know, trip around the world. And so this, you know, if people listen about the timeline, you know, we get into COVID. But so I was able to, you know, bang out the the Europe portion of this trip. And this is my, you know, first like really long backpacking, solo backpacking trip. So I, I flew to back to Barcelona, of course, had to go back for the one time. So I went there and then I started, you know, I didn't plan so much. You know, I, I went to France, then I went, then I wanted to do Eastern Europe. So I went to Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, went to Turkey. And so in terms of visas, the only visa I needed for all these places um, was Turkey. The rest being EU or Albania is not EU, but I didn't need a visa there. So it was very easy to do. And the Turkey visa, I mean, you just get, you can do it like the day before. It's just, it takes like five minutes. You just buy it online kind of thing. You put your passport information in. And so in terms of affordability, yeah, I mean, I travel cheap anyways. You know, I'm, I'm doing the hostels. um, public transport, doing whatever it is that I can find to travel cheap and make my money go the furthest. So, you know, I guess it depends on who the person is. You know, some people are not into hostels. And I think that's a very, you know, telling my friends, Americans, we don't really know what hostels are kind of thing. So, you know, but my mom did hostels in the 80s and she was like, yeah, do some hostels. So I did hostels and I, I, would, I wouldn't go back. So, you know, I travel cheap, as I mentioned. I'm not eating out all that often, or if I am, maybe one, two meals a day. And, you know, I think, you know, it just all depends on how, how you want to budget. And for me, it was, well, I'm going to not spend a lot. I, I don't need a lot. I don't have to have breakfast or, you know, finding hostels that offer the free breakfast. So just like, you know, being like scheming around trying to, you know, find the cheapest way to travel. And in this, this trip, you know, I chose Spain to Bulgaria. That, I mean, that was just a Google Flights thing. We're going to see, where am I going to go? What's the cheapest flight? That was like $20. So it was, it was more keeping my, my day open or my, my plans open to see where, you know, money will take me kind of thing. You know, I'm going to be traveling for five months. You know, I'm not trying to blow the money on, you know, certain things. And also going more east on this trip. It's cheaper out there. So, you know, my, my dollar will go further in a Bulgaria versus a, a France. So, you know, just, just planning that way. Um, but, you know, it was, it was, it was an amazing experience, um, the, whole, the whole Europe portion, because I saw places that, you know, not a lot of information for Albania. I mean, Turkey is pretty big, but like people that I knew, I mean, I haven't, I had never met anyone who had been in Albania. So just I'm fascinated into these kinds of places. And that was the, the driving force for this particular trip. It's a few things that have come up so far, Matt, if you don't mind me saying, you know, you've, you've got a bit of a fearlessness about you and also the, the willingness to kind of take opportunities as they come. I think those are two very, very important things for anyone who has like the aspiration to travel around the world that like you have. So we'll fast forward a little bit because there's a particular part of your story that I find really interesting. And obviously, with it being such a huge global event, we have to we have to talk about it, obviously. You ended up in Thailand and COVID happened. So, so tell us about that chain of events. Like, how, what were you able to do? What was, you know, was there a lockdown, that kind of thing? Kind of talk us through that. Yeah. So it's just crazy because I, I remember before I made it well, to Thailand. So I remember in January, you know, of 2020 or beginning of February, you know, I was in Bulgaria and I remember, you know, I called my dad and I remember seeing one of the, the news headlines talking about, oh, this little, little virus, you know, something, something. So I remember asking, like, oh, did you hear about this virus? And then little did I know, like, that this, you know, impacted the whole world, but, you know, it's particularly this trip. So, you know, I made it to Thailand and the plan was Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Australia, and as I mentioned, back, you know, towards, towards the US. And so I was, go- I was doing a month in Thailand and so I was able to do... Um, well, the full month actually. So I remember being there and maybe after the second week, you know, I was on some small island, Kolanta in, you know, the, the South. And, um, that's when everything just really like hit the fan. So just the, the, the regulations came down, all of the surrounding countries were closing their borders. And so, you know, it was just start. And then the whole concept of masks, which I, I didn't, 
you know, I mean, masks for the air pollution, but then it was like, no, we're using masks for, you know, to prevent the spread of the virus. It's all like a very foreign thing to me. And it just started getting a little, little weird and like crazy with how it was, you know, the curfew. And then as the time progressed, you know, the US, the cases are going up, the world, the cases are going up, all this stuff. And so, you know, then people were getting fined, you know, foreigners in particular, you know, were getting fined in the streets. Like, what are you doing here? Where's your mask? Where's your passport? This and that. And it's just like this kind of crazy time. And so I was at my, a hostel that I'd stayed for a few weeks on on this, this island. And, you know, I met some friends, this Italian guy and, you know, Swiss guy. And so then we decided let's, let's go to Phuket because I think the world is like starting to shut down. Like we need to be somewhere near an airport. If God forbid, you know, we got to get out. So we spent a few days in Phuket and every day new country was closing borders. Cambodia had closed, Myanmar had closed, all the, the neighboring countries. So, you know, I had to take a, I had to make the decision like, yeah, this trip isn't going to, you know, go through with what, how it's you know supposed to go. So now it's like, well, I actually feel like I got to go home now. And so it was just crazy, like having to Google particular airports, particular countries, who's letting in Americans, who's letting in foreigners, who's not allowed on this airline. And it was a wild time. And, you know, the Italian guy I was with, if you remember, Italy was like the worst hit in Europe at the time. He was like blacklisted from everywhere. So at least I wasn't, I didn't have the Italian passport, but it was just crazy. And then, you know, I was getting ready to buy the flight through the UAE on Emirates well, then thank God I didn't because then they just shut their borders and, I, I, you know, it's expensive. It's like, how am I going to get the money? Oh, whole whole thing. So just really like having to call airlines like, hey, so I know it doesn't say this on your website, but you Americans, can they fly on it? And it was a really, you know, scary time for travel, of course, you know, the sickness wise. But in terms of the backpacking, just like, what am I going to do? Am I going to get stuck in Thailand? And then, you know, being in Thailand, you uh for Americans, or I don't know, other countries, but we only had a month there. So it's like, am I going to ex- extend the visa? Are they going to let me extend the visa? Am I going to end up in this country illegally? Like, what, what's, what's all going to happen? And, you know, in the end, I was able to fly through Qatar and, you know, I was able to make it home. But, you know, I, you know, sad to have ended the trip early, but I did get a good two, two and a half months in. And, you know, I wouldn't trade that for, for anything. And you're know, just very, very thankful for that to happen. But it was just, a wild time of what am I doing? How am I going to get home? What do I do? So yeah, <laughs> not, 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 not fun. <laughs> you did touch on something very, very important there though. And I think it's, I think it's really key to pick up on this. So you mentioned that you were able to, to sort of make friends with people from, you know, if you're staying in hostels or you're in an environment where you could meet people from all sorts of different countries, how important is, I mean, obviously it's important, but like how, how important is it in a situation like that, where you have people that you can sort of, you know, have a bit of solidarity with and you can kind of go through this experience together. Like, how important was that in such a chaotic situation? I think it was very important. So for one, the, the big reason with the hostels I do is to meet the people, you know, just to experience people, you know, that you wouldn't get in an Airbnb or a hotel. Like, you know, here I'm in a room with, you know, a Swede, a Swiss, dude, a German, blah, blah, blah. So it's just cool. And like the talking, like I'm a big talker and it was a great way to, you know, connect. And it's just, it's always so easy. Like, where are you from? And then go from there. So... But for here in particular, I mean, it was a huge, huge, um, you know, like you said, the, the solidarity. Because if I were, you know, holed up by myself and whatever, who, who am I chatting to and who, who's going through the same thing? And, you know, here I am, of course, the people from different nationalities and who knows how their countries, you know, are dealing with this COVID thing or how other countries are dealing with their nationalities. But it was that whole, here we are, we're, let's, we're going to Phuket all together. It's three of us. Like, we don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to take this this leap of faith with y'all and, you know, y'all are in the same boat, y'all trying to get home. And, you know, it was that whole, I mean, I mean, this is just such a crazy time. So much uncertainty and something that I don't know how you can ever prepare for, you know, when you travel, like if a catastrophic event, I mean, of course, a you know, natural disaster or something, but what, what's the handbook for this? You know what I mean? So if I have two others that are in that same boat, I mean, we're, we're going to figure it all out together. And, and we did. So, you know, I'm very thankful to have met, met these two guys and, you know, just, you know, we're all in the same boat and we're going to help each other. And, you know, it, it was great. I think it was very important. And I don't know how I would have done all this had it not been for them. Cause I'm, I'm not, you know, again, like I said, by myself talking to a concierge, like, yo, what do you know about this? What do you know about that? No, it's I'm talking to two people, like-minded individuals who are trying to do the same thing as me. Yeah, I, that's, uh, that's massive. And 
so the next bit of your of your career, I, I find that even with you know COVID ravaging, you're still able to get to Busan in South Korea. Is that if I'm right in saying that's August 2020? So that's moving back out east. So that sounds like it was extremely difficult. How did that all come about? Yeah, so, you know, I arrived back in the U.S. um, April of 2020. And again, this is when everything was quarantine central. So I just, I I knew, like, you know, I I didn't have a job at the time, you know, and it was like, well, I I mean, people aren't hiring. It's like COVID kind of thing. So I just remember looking like, is anyone open to continue this journey? Like, I don't want to be stuck here in the U.S. I don't know what's going on in the world or whatever. So Korea, you know, was still accepting people, you know, to, to teach there kind of thing. You know, life went on. Of course, is you know, uber strict with how you would come over kind of thing. But I just, you know, fired up all the recruiters and like, OK, so, yeah, do you have opportunities? I'm going to look into these opportunities. So I was offered a position in, in Busan, as you had mentioned, and. Um, the second biggest city in Korea, which I had no idea about, you know, my, my grandfather fought in the, the Korean war and, you know, he told me, you know, about the geography there, but other than Seoul, I had no, I I didn't know anything about Korea. I just thought it was like cold mountainous, but yeah. So, I mean, like I said, you know, this is my opportunity to like get out of the country and, you know, continue this journey. Like, so Korea fell into place and then I went off to Busan and, you know, of course had to do you know, the COVID stuff, like, beforehand, you know, you have to be negative, and, you know, it can't be this kind of test, you know, it's a very, you know, strict and, you know, whole whole ordeal to get there, but in the end, you know, it worked out, and so I, I arrived there August of 2020, so I was home for a few months, which, yeah, but, but, but it was, it, this was a way to escape that, of course, you know, COVID isn't not in Korea, of course it is, but it's, it's more like, I'm just trying to get that change of scenery and continue with my path, you know, even if I had returned home from this backpacking trip in the duration that it was supposed to be, I still think I would have, you know, tried to make that next international move. So it just, it all worked out really. And, you know, I, as I mentioned, I was able to get that backpacking trip in. But yes, yeah, so arrived in August of 2020 in Busan. And, and when you were in Busan, you worked as a kindergarten teacher, if I'm right in saying, at a language center. Now, could you tell us about that and how challenging it was? Because obviously, you know, you're covering different subjects. It's not as though you're only teaching English. You have to teach a range of things. And, and you have to keep kids at a really young age. You have to keep them engaged in lessons all the time. What challenges does that bring? Yeah, so I think the big thing, though, first, so I was with the kids... Um, okay, well, this was okay. So when you're in Korea, they just changed this. But when you're born, you're one years old, and so everyone uh, on January first like gets a year older. So a kid that's born December thirty first in Korean terms on January first, he will be two years old. Whereas like we think he's two days old. So when they told me they said you'd be working with kids aged like three to six. Okay, well I don't think otherwise. Oh, it must be three to six. Yeah, these kids were, there's some like two year olds. I'm pretty sure there was like some high ones because of this Korean age kind of thing. So I was not used to that or young. So yeah, that was a huge challenge because for one, here I am. I'm not a language assistant anymore. No, I'm, you know, I was floating around between classes. I didn't have my own class, but it was like me leading it. And a lot of times where there wasn't support in there, but it was like, you know, throwing me to the fire, which good, you know, I get that experience. But with the kids, no, that was, that was quite, quite difficult because. You know, there was some curriculum, but it was more like I had to do, I call it baby gym. So I had to, you know, as a gym teacher for some times of the week. And so with like two and three year olds, I didn't know what to do. So, you know, it was like, you know, I'm an athletic guy. I play lacrosse, love sports, as we had mentioned. But with kids that young, I, I did not know what to do. And I had them twice a week. And so it's like, what do I do? I mean, of course, they're like so young. They probably don't remember if we do the same thing twice, but maybe they did. I don't know. But that was so difficult. And as you had mentioned, you know, keeping them engaged, I mean, just it was that whole like kind of experience where it is like this is my first like legitimate teaching, not the language assistant. And even though I had the experience in Barcelona, this is completely different in terms of, you know, the structure and, you know, being with, you know, this young kind of thing. So it's extremely engaged or extremely challenging, but I was able to, you know, push through it. And, you know, I learned a lot, you know, what, what kids like and what they don't. So, of course, you've got to have a lot of like 
music and dance oriented things and you're not lecturing them. They're, they're, they're little kids. So, you know, I was able to gain my wide array of tasks and activities that I would, you know, take to where I am now, like that I'm able to use and I know what kids like and what they don't like kind of thing. But yeah, just that whole age thing really messed me up because it's like, okay, this kid is in a diaper. Like I thought he <laughs> were three year olds out here. Like, so yeah, but it, it was, it was, you know, pretty, pretty funny, but it, it was good. Good. That is wild. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, South Korea is, is a, it's one of the destinations as, you know, as a TEFL course provider, we're, we're asked about opportunities in South Korea all the time, uh, multiple times a day from various, you know, people from all over the world. So uh, apart from the age thing, which is very idiosyncratic, what else should people know about South Korea before they move? Like, was there anything you wish you'd kind of known that might have helped you settle a bit quicker? Or is there anything that even now you think, okay, that's a little different? Like, was there anything in South Korea like that? So I think my whole uh, view of South Korea is a little different, you know, because I went during COVID time. So I haven't really seen the, the true, true South Korea. But I think a big thing there is... I think you should learn um, the the script, the Hangul before. And I think I wish I had learned that beforehand because, you know, I came in, it's like, you know, most of the countries I've been at this time other than China is all in the Latin script. And, you know, and uh, where was I? Bulgaria was Cyrillic. But, you know, at least even if I don't speak German, I can sound out something. But, you know, if I didn't, you know, this was like as foreign as you can be. It's like different writing. It's like, I don't know if this is a bathroom, you know, saying, or this is talking about fried chicken. I don't know. So... You know, learning that would have been helpful. And I think it's very important when you live in these countries to learn just at least a little something beforehand. And, you know, and in the time that you're there, you learn the language anyways. But that would have been huge. And the Hangul, the the, the script is, is quite easy to learn, really. I mean, it's, I don't know, 26 or something, like, I guess we'll call it characters. And it's it's phonetic. So had I learned that before, I would have not been like, oh my God, what, what is this? What is this? You know, it would have been a, I mean, granted, even if I sounded out, I don't know what I'm saying, but at least I could have that baseline. And, but in terms of like things I wish I had known, I think that's the big one. Um, you know, definitely big there with respect and, you know, the, with the elders kind of thing. So, you know, the bowing, but also when you, when you, because I'm younger, like if I'm paying a cashier or something like, I'm, you know, if I, my cards in one hand, like my hand has to be on the other hand and it's just, you know, signs of respect. And, and then when you're soju is really big there. So when you drink, or I guess alcohol in general, but when you drink soju, if, when you cheers, like with the elderly per or the person, the elder cannot see you drinking. So you like cling the glass and you turn so they don't see you. So like these things that, you know, of course there's respect and, you know, where I come from the U S you know, sir, ma'am kind of things like that, but just being open to things are different and, you know, just there's different levels of respect and kind of, you know, formalities and stuff like that. But in terms of big, you know, things I wish I had known, it was just, it was the language I think was the big one. Other than that, um, I think, you know, everything else is just learned there kind of thing and nothing that was detrimental to having gone there in the beginning. Like, oh, I wish I had known this, but it, definitely the language, the Hangul, I think would have would have helped me there. <laughs> Great. So, I mean, there you are in Busan, you know, you've settled there and, and that's where you're living now. You haven't moved anywhere since. Uh, I'm only joking. After the break, we're going to talk to Matt about the uh, <laughs> <laughs> or the next exciting places he's been on his TEFL journey. Are you looking for a weekly guide to what's going on in the TEFL world? Do you want some advice on everything from job interviews to underrated TEFL destinations? Well, the TEFL Org blog has it all. Every single week, we tackle some of the biggest questions in the TEFL industry. Stay up to date with the latest trends in English teaching, find tips to make your next job application your best yet, or get inspired and read about the experiences of TEFL Org graduates teaching all around the world. Whether you're brand new to the industry or you've seen it all, we can guarantee an interesting read each week. To find out more, go to tefl.org forward slash blog. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G forward slash blog. And we're back with Matt Mitchell. So I uh, obviously alluded earlier on before that break in a very sort of cheeky and idiosyncratic way in the entertaining style that I bring to the this podcast. But in all seriousness, you know, you did uh, you moved from 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 Busan. So tell me about the process of going from 
you know, when you felt that you had to leave South Korea and, and, and what happened after that? Yeah, so uh, my contract was August, you know, 2020 to... I was able to... I was stayed actually to September of 2021. And, um, you know, while in South Korea, I met my, my girlfriend. So she's from... Uh, shout out, Pearly. <laughs> so she's from California. And so she was, you know, we met we met in Busan. She had, you know, she'll, she'll, she'll give me something for this. But she, she had DM'd me, you know, from our TEFL program. And, you know, it, one thing led to another. And we, we, we came together. But so she was at a different school at, there at a different time. So I had arrived six months before her. So she was still at her, her Hagwa in the language center until February the following year. So... I, I knew I was, you know, wanted to backpack, you know, we would do this long distance kind of thing. So I, you know, flew, I went from Korea and then I did a little backpacking around Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan, which was an incredible, incredible time. And so came back home and was, you know, just, I was substituting at a school there kind of thing. But because Pearly was still in Korea, her school gave me, you know, the opportunity, they wanted Pearly to stay on. So for at least another month. And she said, you know, no, my, but Matt, my boyfriend, you know, I'm trying to leave. And they, they said, okay, well, he can work here kind of thing for a month. If you just give us one month, we'll give him, you know, some benefits kind of thing. So I was in, um, I did a little, another little trip to, to Serbia. And so the plan was to fly home. But Pearly said, oh, yeah, like you can work at my school. So I told my dad, like, yeah, don't don't wait up for me at the airport. Uh, I'm, I'm going to Korea. So went from Serbia to Korea, which was funny because I had just had a backpack. I didn't have like clothes to work kind of thing. It's like, I thought I was going to Serbia for a week and then going home. Now I'm going to Korea. Crazy, crazy times. So I stayed another month in Korea and I worked at Perilis Hagwon, which is where I met Sally. And so she, they, they were co-workers. So spent the, the last, well, I guess I was there for maybe two months, but a month working kind of thing. And yeah, so we were together again. And then we went home together and, you know, we knew we wanted to teach um, again and so we were just trying to figure out where, and so we had found, well, Pearly had found on a job board a position in, in, in Istanbul, in Turkey. And I had been twice before, and I'm really, I'm a huge fan of, of Istanbul, and, you know, that's the only place in Turkey I had been at the time. But I said, yeah, Pearly, like, yeah, I mean, I've been there before, like, let, let's go do it. And so to segue that, then we accept the position, then we were off to Istanbul in July of twenty. 22, I guess. Yeah. So last, last summer. And then that's, that's how we ended up there because she found it and I had been twice before and I said, yeah, like, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's go. I mean, I mean, what a story that is. First of all, you know, we've, we've talked before on, on the Tefl Org about South Korean uh, teaching companies you know, offering incentives, but like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's quite an incentive. Uh, <laughs> your boyfriend can come and work with us. That's amazing. Um, and, you know, secondly, Secondly, there was a bit of foreshadowing earlier with with Turkey. It's somewhere that clearly you know, you've you've been drawn to a few times. So it's actually, I mean, I, I, from my own experience in terms of in terms of you know writing content and and doing these podcasts, we don't talk an awful lot about Turkey. So as a Tefl destination and as as somewhere to live as 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 a foreigner, tell us tell us what it's like in Istanbul. And also, you know, which football team did you choose? Because there's like five of them. <laughs> Well, firstly, I was thinking about what jersey I'm going to wear for this podcast. I got my Besiktas jersey behind me. So Excellent. that's who I picked. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, totally. I mean, I think the big thing, you know, when you think about teaching English as a foreign language, the, the, the usual suspects, the, the Korea, China, Japan, you know, Spain as well. But so that's why, you know, when Pearly found this position, I was like, oh, wow, cool. Like Turkey is not an international school, you know, because I'm not able to teach at an international school. I don't have my you know, undergrad or whatever in education, but, but she does. But so, you know, she's kind of stuck with me. <laughs> so I, I just, I really wanted to explore that option because it was really like, as you had mentioned, if, if you don't know much about the teaching there, well, I like to be that person to explore it, you know, and, and you know, offer that, you know, advice to, to others kind of thing. And so, you know, going, so Istanbul is an incredible city. So it, it you know, as you know, it straddles, you know, Europe and Asia and, you know, it is, okay, you know, you could say, you know, what does that mean? Well, it is actually two continents, you know, the, the fault lines and stuff. And, you know, it's separated by the Bosphorus Strait. And, you know, it is that crossroads of East and West. And, you know, being a Muslim majority country, it's just, you know, I feel like in Europe, 
a lot of the cities look very similar. You got that town square with the, the, the church and this and that. Well, we don't got that here. It's, it's mosque galore. And for me, I mean, it was awesome because it's like, well, this is a, just a different part of the world. And while it has its European elements, it is, is a lot different. And the thing about Istanbul, it, it's just massive. Like it's the biggest city I've ever been. And it just, it goes on and on and on. The fact that it's two continents, like the, the Asian side is huge, the European side is huge. Let's put these two together and make a city. So incredible. So, you know, having been there twice before, it's like, well, now I have the opportunity to check out all the places I have not been. Now I can go with Pearly. And now we have Turkey at our fingertips because Turkey is a you know, pretty, pretty big country. And so... Yeah, it's just, it's such a great country. But but unfortunately, a big thing that happened, you know, while we were there is just the, the economy and the inflation. Turkey has some of the, the worst rates of inflation with their, their Turkish lira. So that was a, a big, uh, not to term, but, but it's just a damper on our experience where, you know, prices just going up and up. And it's just, it's a shame, you know, for, for everyone involved and just seeing seeing like that firsthand being there for a year. So you know, this was a little different in terms of, you know, Korea with the position I was there. So I was a, a homeroom teacher. So being with that class, you know, all day kind of thing. So I was with the five-year-olds and, you know, I think my experience in Korea, the kids that I worked with until I worked with Pearly School, like their level was, was so low, but these Turks were, were, were quite good. So it was like different, like, you know, I was, I'm able to, you know, teach a certain way and talk a certain way because, you know, their level is quite high. And so that that was a great experience, and you know, I really enjoyed my class, and you know, just very, very nice kids, and yeah, just just Turkey in general, I think is is a beautiful country. So I've been to forty two countries now, and Spain was my favorite in terms of geography, but I think Turkey has surpassed that. I think Turkey has everything, and Spain has has a ton too. But Tur- like we. Turkey has the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. They got the mountains, kind of like desert vibes, Cappadocia. Then you have, we went skiing there. They have the, Istanbul is very green with the forest. So it has everything. And we, we saw a lot of the country and the, the, the Mediterranean is some of the most beautiful places. Like, like everyone, I feel like, you know, is going flocking to Greece and stuff. And yeah, I mean, say, it, they got more of the islands, but it's like the same coastline, but they're just a lot more expensive and a lot more touristed. Where Turkey's the more underrated, you know, more affordable and more untouched, and it's 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 beautiful. And the 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 North region, um, the Black Sea region, went to a city called Trabzon, which I don't know if you know the soccer team there. They they won not too long ago, so um, they. It, it it's 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 on the Black Sea in the mountains. It literally looks like what you would picture, like the Swiss Swiss Alps. And it was that was probably the most beautiful place for me. But some of the most beautiful in the world I've ever seen. It was just so surreal. Like there was no like tourists and stuff, and you know stuff like that is just you know crazy. And then just to talk a little about the football. I mean the football scene out there is is wild. You know they're so passionate, and you know we chose Besiktas because. We uh, lived in the Besiktas neighborhood, but oddly enough, we're like, we're actually closer to the Galatasaray Stadium. So I guess that should have been our team. <laughs> but I made Pearly buy jerseys. We went to a game. We went to Besiktas basketball. They went to Fenerbahce basketball. And as you mentioned, there are a lot of teams there. But, but it's funny, like, the passion for it trickles into the kids. The kids are wearing their jerseys and, and Pearly's class, like kids were kind of getting like fights, like I'm Galatasaray, like I'm Fenerbahce and like we're like physical <laughs> where it's like, oh my God. And just a little story. We took a field trip to the Galatasaray stadium and uh, one of the parents had messaged they were Fenerbahce, which for those who don't know, like Fenerbahce is on the Asian side, Galatasaray is on the European. They're arch rivals. They hate each other. I think Fenerbahce represents more the working class. Galatasaray is more the, the upper class. So it is, it's a class thing, a geography thing. And, you know, every, it's, those are the two big teams, Bet Besiktas in there a little bit. But like the, the, a parent had messaged yeah, like, I don't feel comfortable sending my child to, to the Galatasaray Stadium. Like, my, I, my, my, my daughter, you know, we're supposed to take them to Fenerbahce games, and we teach them, you know, we don't like Galatasaray. So unless you change the trip, like, my child will not go. And just thinking, like, oh, my, this is just, like, a game about kicking a ball, but, but it's, it, it's so much more than that. And just 
like how wild that was because I was trying to put into perspective like what if back home we went to an American football stadium with you know for Baltimore like if we went to Pittsburgh would this be up would parents be up in arms and maybe they would I don't know but it was just crazy you know awesome but awesome experience you know and uh, the food is amazing out there and yeah I can't can't talk enough about Turkey. <laughs> and, and now you know you, you've made that move from somewhere that, and this is what I really admire about your story is is that you know you're talking very glowing terms about places that you've you've lived and worked in, but you still have that desire to to move and experience something else. So now you're in Guatemala, um, and as as we said right at the top of the episode, you've expressed a desire to travel to every country in the world. Now, first of all, how, how are you settling in Guatemala? Because I, I don't believe it's been that long since you arrived there. And, and also, where does that desire come from? And, and where where is next on your list? And why is it Scotland? Oh, Scotland's hard. I, I, I need to go because I have not been there. And I got to hit all the countries. And my parents rave about Scotland, so I got to go. But so Guatemala, because so now where I am in my journey, we, we came back from Turkey in August or July, this you know, a few months ago. And now we've been teaching English online and just, you know, taking this whole digital nomad step kind of thing where to see where it will take us. So the plan is we, we just arrived to Guatemala a few weeks ago, with, or no, a few, few days ago, actually, um, which this was a Google flight kind of thing. We were in L.A. because we're Pearlie's from and we decided let's go somewhere in Central America. Well, it was a $40 flight, which I feel like that, that's OK in Europe. But like for, for from the U.S., that's insane. It's a four and a half hour flight. And I was like, okay, let's see, let's go to Guatemala. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it's, it's been great so far. We're in Guatemala City. We'll be here for three weeks. Um, and then, you know, go home for some weddings. But then you're just going to take this online thing abroad. And so briefly, I, um, I mentioned, you know, lacrosse is my big sport. I found it, you know, in Spain, played in some tournament. And Turkey found it, played in Serbia. Well, I've been invited to play with the Turkey team. So we're oh, playing yeah. at a tournament in, in Greece. So that will be Greece. Then we're trying to bounce around in Europe. And we'll get to Scotland. I, I, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, just seeing where this digital nomad stuff will go. And, you know, just, you know, see, seeing the challenges, but also the benefits of doing it. You know, you know, here I am now having to look for Wi-Fi, caring about that a little more now. But... Yeah, just just seeing where where life will take me, uh, well, us, and you know, with this online thing, we're not tied to a school, so we can you know just bounce around. Just you know, the issue is working with time zones, but yeah, it's a challenge and you know adventure right now. Brilliant. And just uh, before we get to where people can find you and what you're working on at the moment uh, outside of teaching, uh, you know, with with the experience that you have and the countries that you've been to, and and you know the things that you've been able to do. To someone who's desperate, who's listened to this and is absolutely desperate to see the world and to teach English as a foreign language or to teach in general, what bit of underrated travel advice would you give? Simply put, what would do you wish someone had told you before you started this life? Um, yeah, so, okay, well, the big, the big thing for me, uh, I was told this, but I didn't do it. My mom pushed studying abroad on me. And as I mentioned, she, she did it in Madrid and so it was an amazing time. And while I was in college, she kept telling me, which I feel like a lot of parents aren't telling their child to do that. It's more you're trying to convince your parent to let you do that. But she did. And I didn't do it. And that would have given me more of an opportunity to explore, you know, and, and be where I am now. Where It's it's ironic because, you know, at the beginning of college, you know, the travel, I'd go with my parents. But, like, I wasn't so big into, like, you know, travel, study abroad. Like, I was big in, you know, FOMO, <laughs> fear of missing out. So... Yeah, I just would tell everyone, you know, if you're young and like do that study abroad if you have that opportunity to. And and you ask about un, like underrated travel advice. I, I don't think my thing is underrated. It's just more just do it, you know. If if you are if you ever have an inkling or an urge to go out of your comfort zone and do that teach abroad, do something like that, just do it. There are a million reasons not to do something, but if you listen to that every time, then where will you get in your life, kind of thing. And and I think FOMO is a big deterrent for people, but life goes on, like. When I come back from these trips, I just find out like, okay, yeah, some people haven't, but a lot of the life is kind of the same kind of thing. So why not experience that life in a different place? And I think everyone should have the chance to live abroad because it's so different than traveling to a place, you know, these three countries that I've lived in, what, like I saw what it is for, I mean, I've spent a year in, and some in each of these countries and that's a lot different than traveling there. So I was, you know, I just, I think don't listen to all the 
the doubts of, of doing this kind of thing. It, it, life's an adventure, so why not make the most of it? And I think this is a huge way to, to do Brilliant. that. I, I, couldn't, I literally couldn't have asked for a better quote than that. That's amazing. That's going to get clipped. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, Thank you. So, Matt, I'd be remiss not to ask you about, as someone who's very much in the podcast world, um, otherwise we wouldn't be talking, um, tell, me about, tell me about your podcast and, and what you're working on as well as teaching online and, and traveling the globe. Yeah, so... Um, at- as you know from here, just in general, like I'm a talker. You ask anyone who's met me, I'm, I'm, I'm talking your ear off or whatever. But, you know, so I've been on several podcasts, you know, before. I think this is like my eighth or ninth, maybe tenth podcast. And I, just, I live for that to tell my story, but also to explore, you know, and listen, explore the world through other people's eyes. And I started a podcast. Uh, my mantra in life and my, my Instagram, I have a travel account, is making moves with Matt because I go through life just making moves so naturally i created a podcast because i figured if i love being on podcast so much why not do my own travel podcast so i'm doing a travel podcast based on you know kind of like this you know it could be the teaching english but also just the backpacking just you know i'm seven episodes deep and i just i really love it because it's a way to connect and you know i've done it so far with people that i have met because i've met many many people from travels but I want it to be more, you know, strangers and to focus on country specific. Who, who here has been to Azerbaijan? Let's talk about it for an hour. So just trying to grow it in that way. And yeah, just talk about people's moves because you're making moves with me. <laughs> all right. So that, that's, that's my podcast. And I just that's my passion right now. So, yeah. Awesome. So making moves with Matt, look it up, get it Googled. Um, Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, mate. We could have done a few more hours here, but uh, I'm going to have to, you know, I, I know your, your time is very precious, so uh, we'll have to wrap it there. But when you do eventually come to Scotland, I'll, uh, I'll let you know which football stadiums are okay to go to. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to I Taught English Abroad a podcast series by the TEFL Org. To keep up to date with every episode, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your streaming platform of choice. And we love feedback, so feel free to leave us a review on any platform you like. For more information about the TEFL Org or about teaching English as a foreign language in general, head on over to tefl.org. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.